remains vulnerable to the asymmetrical impacts of climate change. Therefore, at COP27, Namibia plans to announce major developments in its ambitions to decarbonize global hard to abate sectors through the production of green hydrogen. Furthermore, the first hydrogen to power project in Africa is expected to be operational by 2024 in the town of Swakopmund in Namibia. This is an example of what is possible when we pull together in the same direction. Our ambitions are not only necessary to mitigate the ravaging, ravaging impacts of climate change, but are also a critical component of our post-COVID-19 economic recovery. Therefore, Namibia remains ready to work with the international community to ensure the most optimal utilization of its natural resources to combat climate change. A just energy transition is about fair opportunities for developing nations to sustainably access natural endowments at their disposal. Namibia has recently discovered promising deposits of hydrocarbons and is exploring significant deposits of rare earth metals. As part of our goal to ensure sustainable utilization of our natural resources, I recently launched the Velvicia Fund, our nation's sovereign wealth fund. The fund is a demonstration of our commitment to fiscal prudence and sustainable resource management for current and future generations. Mr. President, in conclusion, today on the 21st of September 2022, we are convening in this chamber on the United Nations International Day of Peace under the theme, quote unquote, and racism, build peace. Peace is a wonderful gift but a fragile one if it is not handled properly. Peace is more than the absence of war. Peace is about inclusivity and development of all nations. Our United Nations, as the premier guarantor of multilateralism, is our best bet to ensure a peaceful and prosperous humanity. Namibia will continue to, play, to place a high premium on the noble aspirations of the United Nations as a beacon of hope and equality, hope and equality of all nations. As a beneficiary of successful multilateral efforts, which we hold in high regard the convening power of this August Assembly, and recommit to working with fellow member states to change the world for the better. I thank you very much. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Namibia for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Borut Pahor, President of the Republic of Slovenia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Borut Pahor, President of the Republic of Slovenia, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. I was born after the Second World War. So, all my life, the cry of never again, never again, has echoed around the world and especially in Europe. With the exception of the war in Balkans, even the major geopolitical changes in Europe since the fall of Berlin Wall have been peaceful. This has made an important contribution to building hope 
for a lasting peace. This hope has been thoroughly shaken by the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Will this make us stop believing in the possibility of lasting peace? I think no. We must not leave our children a world in a fear of war. For the sake of their secure future, we have a duty to do whatever it takes we can to ensure that the precious hope, precious hope for a lasting peace returns to our hearts. After all, it was with this hope and our shared responsibility that the United Nations was founded. The United Nations has set very clear rules of engagement to which all members have committed ourselves. This include a commitment to peaceful settlement of disputes, cooperation and respect for fundamental human dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to speak about peace, climate change, and multilateralism today. First of all, number one, peace and security. The Russian Federation's decision for a military attack on Ukraine has shaken these rules. So have many other armed conflicts in different parts of the world. The Russian aggression has put international security at risk. Yesterday's announcement of President Putin that there will be a referendum in parts of Ukraine is a continuation of aggression and, it, and is in breach of international law. I especially condemn his word about possible use of nu nuclear weapon. This war is threatening the already fragile stability of the Western Balkans. It has also threatened international food and energy security. I commend the UN Secretary General for his engagement and Turkey for its support to reach the agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, peace is, as it has been just said, not just an absence of war. In peace, leaders should strengthen and nature good relations with other countries. It is our obligation to resolve outstanding issues in a spirit of compromise and mutual understanding. Only in this way, we will reduce the chances of all grievances and historical traumas uh, to come uh, to life once again. I'm grateful to many of you for the opportunity to, this, to do this together for the benefit of well-being of our countries and the wider international community. Fostering good relations and building trust within societies and between them is the most effective means of preventing armed conflicts. Number two, more cooperation for a better future. Nurturing and strengthening good relations between countries is also necessary to address more efficiently the challenges of our times. Among these, climate change is one of the most pressing. Our common task is to preserve the planet for future generations. What we need is more efficient measures and more solidarity. Slovenia pledges special support to Africa, Caribbean and Pacific to assist them in their efforts against biodiversity loss, water stress and climate damage. We are contributing to the least developed countries fund of the global environment facility. Initiating the Green Group, Slovenia is working together with like-minded countries in the promotion of green policies. We are deeply grateful to the General Assembly for the historic universal recognition of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Slovenia was one of the original proponents, along with Costa Rica, Maldives, Morocco, and Switzerland. That was a much needed boost for multilateralism, but we can and we should do more. 
The upcoming UN climate change, biodiversity, and water conference are an excellent opportunity to commit ourselves to do more and better. I wish to thank the Secretary General for putting forward the one, our common agenda report. We support the proposed Second World Social Summit in 2025 and expect it to address the challenges of structural inequalities. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no security and development without respect of human dignity. In all our efforts, we should be led by right-based approach. We should be attentive to all signs of human rights regression and should act accordingly. And finally, number three, strengthening multilateralism and candidature uh, for the United Nations Security Council. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, the UN Charter is, the, is a fundament of our international system. Rule-based order is a sine qua non for maintaining peace and security, a just and balanced international system. Slovenia has proved itself a re reliable and uh, trustworthy member of the UN family and an honest broker. We are engaged in a genuine dialogue and constant search for creative and uh, good solutions to our common challenges. We are part of peacemaking and stabilization uh, efforts that includes humanitarian demining, rehabilitation, and saving the lives of civilians all around the globe. We are actively participating in efforts to strengthen the legal framework and respect for international law, including ending impunity. We build trust to secure a better future. Let me say that my country, Slovenia, has no enemies, but only friends all around the globe. Slovenia is well placed to be a non-permanent member of the Security Council 2024 to 2025. Endless striving for peace, justice, mutual understanding, reconciliation, both within and between societies. Respect for ethnic, national, religious di diversities, promotion of sustainable development and solidarity. This is the task of Slovenia, and this is our common task. I would like to thank you for your attention. I wish you all the best. Au nom de l'Assemblée générale, je tiens à remercier. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Slovenia for the statement and a request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency, Mr. William Samoruto, President and Commander in Chief of the Defense Forces of the Republic of Kenya. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. Au nom de l'Assemblée générale. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency William Samoy Ruto, President and Commander in Chief of the Defense Forces of the Republic of Kenya, and invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President of this 77th session of the UN General Assembly, Your Excellency Saba Korosi, Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Excellency Antonio Guterres, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I am grateful for the immense privilege to join Your Excellencies in this distinguished assembly, a privilege made possible by peaceful democratic transition following free and fair elections in Kenya on the 9th of August, 2022. Elections that not only stand as testimony of the universal power of democracy, but also of the manifest ability of African peoples to invest in stronger nations and a secure future. Robust institutions, 
effective constitutions, and the impartial administration of the rule of law guarantees the achievement of shares aspirations. This 77th session of the UN General Assembly comes at a unique moment when the entire world is struggling with multiple grave challenges that include regional conflicts, the COVID-19 pandemic, the triple planetary crisis, food insecurity, and the rising cost of living. I take this opportunity to congratulate you, Mr. President, on your election to preside over this session and to express my confidence that your wealth of experience offers us significant assurance of your good leadership. Your motto, solutions through solidarity, sustainability, and science, succinctly captures with particular resonance the urgent imperatives of our time. I assure you of Kenya's firm support and cooperation during your tenure. I further take this opportunity to commend your predecessor, His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, for his bold steps in steering the United Nations community and for ensuring its business continuity under the unprecedented circumstances occasioned by multiple global threats such as the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> Excellencies, human well-being is under grave threat. The health of the planet requires urgent attention. The immense pressure exerted by conventional threats such as climate change, the global food crisis, terrorism, cybercrime, and armed conflict has been compounded by unprecedented, devastating disruptions due to COVID-19. I express my approval of the theme for this session, a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. Because of its boldly signif uh, signals, because it boldly signals the window of opportunity we now have to escalate our engagement from firm consensus to decisive action. In many respects, the COVID-19 pandemic stripped us of many illusions and exposed stark justice and solidarity deficits in the face of existential crisis. It brought into sharp focus the global economy's two-lane highway, repressively patrolled by a rising tide of exclusionist nationalism, a specter that undermines prospects of collective action and significantly impairs the resolve of the international community to guarantee fundamental rights, including safety and dignity of the world's vulnerable majority. It is also for this reason that many nations, especially from the global south, now advocate for the democratization of the global governance and a reimagined multilateralism that is inclusive and works for the good of all. Kenya stands ready to work with other nations to achieve the pan the pan An Africanization of multilateralism and a more just and inclusive system of global governance. It is important to reflect on these matters as we do our best to get our people, enterprises, and industries back on their feet so that the engine of development can power our societies towards prosperity that actually leaves no one behind. Building back better is the universal rallying call to incorporate lessons learned into doing more in a better way to, cover, to recover from the shock. I suggest that we have a golden opportunity to faithfully adhere to this motto by augmenting it inward and indeed with an additional B, 
Building Back Better from the Bottom. Building Back Better from the Bottom Upwards is essentially about including the marginalized working maturity in the economic mainstream. The bottom millions relentlessly wage their daily battle for survival in a crowded arena characterized by scarcity of opportunity and generally precarious existence. The ingenuity, optimism, resilience, and energy in this ever bustling bottom is sometimes called hustling. Invisibly to policymakers and beyond the reach of many public services, these hustlers take nothing for granted, surviving overwhelming odds and frequently succeeding greatly. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, things may come to those who wait, but only things left behind by those who hustle. It is time to bolster the resilience of our nations, to mainstream these millions through deliberate strategies and efforts for economic inclusion by building back better from the bottom up. The interlocking challenges of conflicts, triple planetary crisis, and the global food crisis have impeded our momentum and obstructed our focus on achieving fundamental transformations towards sustainable development. In the Horn of Africa region, severe drought and disruption of supply chains due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the Russia-Ukraine conflict, have left us food insecure, and consequently, we have been constrained to repurpose our strategies to prioritize drought and famine relief, insulating education and disruption from disruption and improving social protection and healthcare systems to secure the well-being of our people. Many countries now bear witness to the unsettling phenomena of rivers, canals, and water reservoirs that are drying up on account of drought and heat waves occasioned by climate change. Kenya is no exception. The northern arid and semi-arid rangelands of our country have been gravely impacted by drought, whose severity has not been seen or experienced in 40 years. 3.1 million residents of these assaults are now severely food insecure on account of scarce rainfall over three consecutive seasons, leading to poor crop and pasture. This unprecedented confluence of intensely adverse events has exacerbated water scarcity and starvation worsened by rising food prices, thus complicating Kenya's roadmap towards delivering good quality of life to our citizens and hindering the progress to achieving SDG number six and SDG number two. Severe drought has affected not only the Horn of Africa, and the Sahel regions, but continues to devastate many others, including Asia, Europe, and the Americas. If for no other reason, the fact that we all are in this together must strengthen the case for concerted efforts across continents. With this in mind, I call on member states and all relevant stakeholders to demonstrate strong political will and showcase effective cooperation by supporting the most affected countries financially, as well as through sharing land restoration and climate change adap adaptation technologies. It is through collaboration to expand inclusion that we can attain a new paradigm in multilateralism. The latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reminds us that we cannot afford to waste another moment debating the merits of doing something vis-a-vis -vis doing nothing. It will soon be too late to reverse the course of events, and then even the best possible interventions will not suffice. As leaders, every day is an opportunity to expedite our efforts to confront the triple planetary crisis. It will be recalled that during the Stockholm Plan 50 meeting, which Kenya had the honor of co-hosting with Sweden, 
There was consensus from states on the need to act urgently in addressing environmental impacts. Given this agreement, it is deeply concerning that little progress has been made in respect of the needful actions. It is time to collectively contemplate urgent measures needed to implement high priority actions required to contain ongoing disruptions as we deliberate on long-term implementation approaches to be undertaken. I fully agree with the Secretary General's memorable statement that, and I quote, we have a rendezvous with a climate disaster, end of quote. I add that we must not be taken by surprise. If indeed forewarned is forearmed, this is our opportunity to mobilize with tremendous urgency and take action at once. Excellencies, the agricultural sector has an important part to play in reducing the severity of climate change. A number of practices have a bearing, positive or negative, on various dimensions of the environment. Investing in modern agricultural technology is therefore one important avenue towards tackling prevailing environmental changes. Kenya is, res is responding through substantial investment in climate resilient agriculture. At the core of our 10-year strategy for agricultural sector growth and transformation are nine flagships. They include the registration of farmers to direct incentives, improving farmer practice through customized extension services, monitoring of emergency food reserve stocks using digital food balance sheet and the use of early warning systems to monitor food supplies and market prices. Agriculture, agriculture remains the bedrock of the development of many nations and will thus continue to hold the key to the creation of equitable and sustainable growth for our people. No country, large or small, has ever attained significant growth without modernizing its agricultural sector. And as we rededicate ourselves to these targets, we must, in the immediate term, find answers to the severe deficit in the availability, flow, and accessibility of fertilizer to our farmers worldwide. I couldn't agree more with Secretary General Guterres on his warning right here yesterday that, and I quote, without action now, the global fertilizer shortage will quickly move into a global food shortage, end of quote. We are encouraged to note that education, health, agriculture, and numerous other public services have become increasingly reliant on digital access. The world needs greater investment in the development of ICT infrastructure accompanied with policies that support innovation and increased acquisition and deployment of technology. In so doing, we should be driven by the conviction that these measures offer a viable shortcut to poverty reduction and the promotion of inclusive development. I call for stronger global partnerships to enhance ICT infrastructure in developing countries and bridge the yawning digital divide between the global south and the rest of the world. Excellencies, this 77th session of the Assembly follows the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, at 50, as well as Stockholm Plus 50, and the fourth United Nations Ocean Conference in Lisbon. Outcomes of these conferences demanded real commitment to address global environmental concerns as a matter of urgency and for a just transition to sustainable economies that work for all people. The March 2022 landmark resolution of the fifth United Nations Environmental Assembly in Nairobi to end plastic pollution is a decisive signal to the world that the world is prepared and motivated to act on this menace. Kenya is committed to work closely with other nations to pursue legally binding instruments aimed 
at bringing an end to plastic pollution. As the host nation to UNEP and the UN Habitat, Kenya affirms that these critical United Nations agencies have an indispensable role in the promotion of environmental sustainability globally, as well as developing socially and environmentally sound and sustainable cities. In keeping with its strong commitment to multilateral institutions, Kenya has made available more land for the United Nations office in Nairobi to facilitate the upgrading of its complex. I take this opportunity to call on member states to complement this contribution from, through enhanced financing to adequately modernize the union facilities in Nairobi. Kenya remains a strong advocate for making the sustainable use of oceans and blue economy resources a development priority, holding the firm belief that significantly increased investment in this essential sector can end hunger, can also reduce poverty, create jobs, and spur economic growth. I urge the Secretary General to continue calling attention to the urgent need to develop this vital sector. In particular, I call on developed countries to invest in sustainable fishing, protect marine ecosystems, and share ocean-based climate solutions with developing countries. For our part, I am pleased to report that building on the historic 2018 Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi, Kenya is reviewing its national blue economy strategy to strengthen community structures in participatory management of fresh water, coastal and marine resources, and ecosystems. The strategy is expected to contribute to our economic development through food and nutrition security, coastal and rural development, and income increases along the aquaculture value chain. It also enhances maritime transport and tourism. We invite development partnerships to invest in Africa towards building capacity to sustainably utilize marine resources. We must rally together to make the best use of Africa's vast blue resources in developing our economies while meeting our climate targets. As we look forward to the 27th Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, COP27, Scheduled for Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, it is logical to expect that member states will shift their attention towards the development and implementation of frameworks for climate change mitigation. Accomplishment of pending actions by member states is essential for the implementation work that lie ahead. I therefore call upon all of us to urgently deliver on all commitments made towards climate change financing. On this matter, it is critical to emphasize that we are running out of time. Over the past decade, Kenya has sustained its aggressive pursuit for rapid socioeconomic transformation through three principal roadmaps. First is the Kenyan National Vision 2030, Second, the formal long-term blueprint aimed at transforming Kenya into a newly industrialized, upper middle income country, providing high quality of life to its citizens in a clean and secure environment by 2030. The second has been the Africa Union's Agenda 2063, and the third, the Sustainable Development Goals. Kenya looks towards tapping into a variety of resources to catalyze the achievement of these interlocking and mutually reinforcing objectives. The disruption and ensuing crisis due to COVID-19 pandemic compelled us to diversify our focus into new interventions, including economic stimulus program, a COVID-19 economic recovery strategy, and a COVID-19 socioeconomic re-engineering recovery strategy, all aimed at mitigating the adverse impacts of the pandemic. 
I confirm that we have done the best of everything we could in the circumstances. Nevertheless, it is not enough. Kenya and the rest of Africa, like other developing nations, are in need of greater international partnership and cooperation to avert economic crisis in the wake of the pandemic. Developing countries being heavily burdened by external debt servicing run the risk of losing development gains due to the shocks inflicted by the pandemic and associated disruptions. I call upon global financial institutions and the international community to take urge, urgent measures and release all existing financial instruments to provide much needed additional liquidity and secure better fiscal space for developing countries like Kenya to enhance social investment, support climate change adaptation and mitigation, and address security needs and resolve development financing challenges. On behalf of Kenya, therefore, I join other leaders in calling upon the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and other multilateral lenders to extend pandemic-related debt relief to the worst-hit countries, especially those affected by the devastating combination of conflict, climate change, and COVID-19. Furthermore, I urge the G20 to extend and expand the scope of the Common Framework to suspend or reschedule debt repayments by middle-income countries during the pandemic recovery period. At this point, I would like this distinguished assembly to take a moment and consider the peace and security landscape, a landscape currently beset with multiple challenges, yet abounding with considerable opportunities. Our home region of East and Horn of Africa is in particular burdened by significant conflicts and challenges with implications for the region's development. We stand on the cusp of fast opportunity for galvanizing confidence-building measures to generate and sustain momentum towards sustainable peace. In its role as an anchor state in the region, Kenya has sustained our investment in diplomatic efforts to find lasting peace in multiple situations within and beyond the region. Although some processes have yielded undeniable success, challenges remain. I therefore strongly reiterate our call for partnership towards confident building measures and urge more concerted efforts towards sustainable peace and stability. Kenya is currently serving in the United Nations Security Council. I am proud to confirm that our engagement over the last two years has prioritized regional peace and security, counter, countering terrorism and violent extremism, peace support operations, climate and security as critical contributions to the collective efforts to build a safer, more prosperous and peaceful world. I am also proud to state that Kenya has continued to champion closer cooperation between regional mechanisms and the Security Council as an effective means to achieving international peace and security. Kenya continues to advocate the renewal of the Africa Union security architecture, which draws comparative strength from the highly productive complementarity between the United Nations, the Africa Union, and the regional economic communities. Working closely with the two elected African countries of the A3 in the UN Security Council, we are committed to finding a stronger Africa voice in the Council and achieving a consensus-driven, rules-based multilateral system. It is our manifest intention to see greater pan-Africanization of the global agenda in order to make multilateralism work for the people of the world in their diversity. It is time for multilateralism to reflect the voice of farmers, represent the hopes of villagers, champion the aspirations of pastoralists, 
defend the rights of fisher folk, express the dreams of traders, respect the wishes of workers, and indeed protect the welfare of all peoples of the global south. Let me express the strong collective conviction of my country that the relevance, legitimacy, and moral authority of the United Nations will forever remain deficient, undermined by the absence of comprehensive reforms of the United Nations Security Council. We therefore remain firmly committed to reforming the Security Council to make it a more effective, representative, and democratic global institution. Given the magnitude and variety of challenges the world continues to confront, a more fit for, a more fit for purpose United Nations is urgently needed, one that possesses the legitimacy and efficacy in dealing with threats to international peace and security. A just and inclusive world order cannot be spearheaded by a United Nations Security Council that persistently and unjustly fails the inclusivity criteria. Similarly, threats to democracy will not be credibly resolved by an undemocratic, unrepresentative Security Council. It is vitally important for this critical institution to reflect the values it is entrusted to protect, to defend, to uphold on behalf of humankind. We welcome the call by President Biden this morning for the expansion of the membership of the Security Council as a significant step in the right direction, and we look forward to building consensus for the actualization of the same. The COVID-19 pandemic severely disrupted health systems, seriously challenging the implementation of programs that are vital for the realization of health-related sustainable development goals. To place us firmly back on track and accelerate our progress towards these SDGs targets, it is imperative for us to foster sustainable partnerships between governments, other state actors, the civil society, and the private sector. This modality of collective action is particularly vital for building resilient health systems whose importance in enabling us withstand future pandemics and other health crises can no longer be disputed. For this reason, Kenya will continue to strongly support the development of legally binding World Health Organization international instrument to anchor global solidarity and promote equity. The fact of the matter is that the COVID-19 pandemic exposed for all the world to see the severe deficit of these critical values in our present multilateral configuration. Global supply chains remained impervious to demands in the global south generally, and Africa in particular. And equal access to vaccines underscored this unjust and unequal situation with unforgettable clarity. Whenever human life, security, and welfare is in jeopardy, it is immoral to administer interventions through frameworks that are anchored on fundamental inequality. We are all witnesses to admirable demonstrations of effective solidarity in response to crises in various parts of the world. Our knowledge of the possibility of spontaneous yet resolute global solidarity reinforces the African exception as particularly repugnant. From genocides, and civil conflict to famine and pandemics, the African continent is consistently left behind to bear the brunt of weak solidarity and disastrous failure of multilateralism. History indicates the last time Africa was the focal point of strong and effective multilateralism and multilateral consensus was during the Berlin Conference 
of 1884-1885 and the character of the ensuing interventions casts a long shadow to date. Not to put too fine a point to it, the failure of multilateralism during crises which relegate the people of Africa outside the cycle of moral consideration and normalizes humanitarian neglect and other casual injustices are failures of humanity. Nothing about Africa, and I say nothing about Africa or its people makes it acceptable for this type of failure to persist in this era. And we have an urgent moral duty to better, to do better, and to right this wrong. For decades, Africa has borne the brunt of three epidemics, the HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. I applaud innovative partnerships like the Global Fund for their, pro for their progress in addressing the three menaces, and also welcome the ambitious targets set for the seventh replenishment cycle. Kenya is committed to supporting the Global Fund and implementing the agreed targets in order to actualize our pledge at the replenishment conference. Kenya calls upon all countries implementing the Global Fund programs, especially fellow African states, to remain at the forefront in championing for successful replenishment of the fund. This way, the mobilization of much needed resources is enhanced, bringing us closer to the final elimination of these dangerous diseases. In conclusion, Kenya joins the Secretary General in calling for the strengthening of multilateralism as the only sustainable path to a peaceful, stable, and prosperous world for all. This is the imperative of our time and the call of this moment. It is time to work on the trust deficit with stronger conviction that none of us is really safe until all of us are safe. The theme of the 77th session, and I quote, a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges, end of quote, demands that we recognize the crisis we must confront are interlinked in a complicated way. They can only be effectively addressed through more imaginative strategies and innovative formula. A population of 8 billion people in a densely networked world increasingly looks up to the multilateral system as the anchor for their individual aspirations directly and indirectly through robust national frameworks. Increasingly, therefore, the United Nations system is expected to be responsive to these needs and for the proceedings in this forum, in a forum like this, to speak to ordinary people in far-flung reaches of our incredibly diverse globe. It is impossible to address all their individual needs directly, but it is possible to respond to all of them by speaking with conviction to the universal values of equality, inclusion, justice, solidarity, and collective action, and by making sure that all our interventions effectively reflect them with clarity. The integrity of the international order must be measured by the distance separating our resolutions, consensus, and agreement from decisions, actions, committed interventions, and effective solutions. A watershed moment, therefore, demands that we reduce that gap drastically and quickly. Kenya pursues numerous essential domestic agenda through the multilateral framework. We are heavily invested in the strength, effectiveness, and eventual success of all in interventions formulated by the United Nations. It is important that the output of this and other similar fora achieve immediate resonance in the minds and lives of our youth still seeking opportunity to express and actualize themselves, our farmers working to feed nations, 
our Jua Kali entrepreneurs striving in pursuit of success in the informal economy and our professionals who formulate policy, implement strategy, and monitor service delivery in public and private sectors. Africa places immense value in the international community and the tremendous possibilities it can unlock through inclusive, sustainable, and effective action to transform the lives of our people and establish lasting peace, security, and shared prosperity. This watershed moment is our chance to turn the key and open this door of opportunity. We can make progress in addressing the triple global threats and liberate ourselves from the shame of past failures of multilateralism. At this watershed moment, we must not only choose, but also act decisively to bequeath our children and their children a greener, safer, healthier, and more abundant earth. Let us do it together, inclusively, multilaterally. I thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander-in-Chief of the Defence Forces of the Republic of Kenya for his statement, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Ali Bongo Ndiba, President of the Gabonese Republic. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. Oh, no. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Ali Bongo Ondiba, President of the Gabonese Republic and I invite him to address the Assembly. Madam. Heads of State and Government, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, I convey to you my congratulations on your election to the presidency of the 77th General Assembly of the United Nations, and I wish you every success. I greet and congratulate your predecessor, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, for the commitment which was patently clear throughout the 76th session. To the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, I reiterate the full support of my country as he serves our organization. Mr. President, I am delighted to once again stand earnestly before this rostrum because the situation demands just that. Indeed, the international system is at a critical juncture. The world struggles to recover from a pandemic and sits in the clutches of a multidimensional crisis. The emergence of new centres of influence means that positions have become increasingly more entrenched. And this situation means that we must prioritise ongoing dialogue in order to find global consensus, rather than prioritising power struggles as we tackle issues which are sensitive within the multilateral system. In the face of rivalry between powers and in the face of multifaceted challenges which are of shared concern, it would be dangerously naive to continue to opt for power struggles or for unilateral positions. The interconnected nature of global issues and 
of national economies means that we must engage in dialogue in order to respond appropriately and, above all, collectively to the most serious threats to international peace and security. We are in the last quarter of a year which has seen global challenges grow tougher. They have laid waste to common and individual efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. With less than eight years to go until the deadline, it is crucial to evaluate our progress in light of a threat which the COVID-19 pandemic has meant continues to weigh heavy on our economies. A threat which is just as insidious now hovers over our economies. This threat is inflation. Throughout the world, inflation is reaching tragic highs. No one is spared, not businesses or households, not the North or the South. Its effects are devastating. As such, we must act, individually of course. That is exactly what Gabon is doing by subsidizing certain commodities and by keeping their prices at certain levels. But here too, we will not successfully overcome this problem if we do not act collectively in a coordinated fashion and with a sense of solidarity. This is yet one more challenge issued to the world. We must together, all together, overcome it. President, this year marks many new beginnings for Gabon as we arise from the tragedy and forced inertia of the coronavirus pandemic and reopen to the world. We are the newest member of the Commonwealth of Nations, home to 2.5 billion people, one third of the world's population, with shared values of respect for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. My country is broadening horizons for our citizens and seizing the chance for our young people to benefit from studying, traveling, and building business relationships far beyond our own borders. As 